All right, let's let's get things kicked off. I think, and as as we get started, um, uh, others can join. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you uh, this evening to this uh, we webinar. Um, my name is Michael Diamond. I'm the academic director of the Integrated Marketing and Communications Department within uh, the School of Professional Studies in its Division of Programs and Business here at NYU. And uh, as we have done on, on several occasions in the past, it really gives me enormous pleasure to welcome you all into this dialogue we've been having uh, that we call Lessons from China. Um, Paul Lin uh, and Bryce Whitwam, uh, two of my very esteemed colleagues who teach in our Shanghai Go Local program. Uh, and I thought that there was a lot of opportunity to try and share some of the innovation and the thinking and, and the examples and the stories uh, from business leaders, marketers, communicators in China, as we were thinking collectively about the various forces uh, that were reshaping or transforming marketing and communications. And it's been a truly wonderful dialogue uh, over the past year and a half or two. Um, so thanks, obviously, to Paul and, and, and Bryce uh, for helping us curate this. Um, and importantly, uh, two people who sort of go unsung uh, Robin Smith and, and Patrick Brady, who are helping pull everything together this evening, I want to thank them. And more importantly, to all of our students and faculty and, and friends who are, who are joining. So I'm absolutely delighted uh, that this occasion gives us a chance to welcome Carol Zhao back to um, NYU, I guess. She was an alum of NYU Stern as an undergraduate um, and now um, is seen as really one of the more iconic uh, thoughtful and progressive figures in sort of reshaping the fashion industry and has a wonderful role at Shiseido um, as an SVP uh, driving business transformation. It's also uh, a, a happy occasion for us because uh, we have a new dean um, at the school and uh, she uh, saw what we were up to and, and uh, was, thought she'd be delighted to join us and say a few words. So I would love to invite um, Dean Angie Kamath uh, to say a few words of introduction and then we'll we'll jump back into the program. Thank you so much, Michael, and um, just a real pleasure. Thanks for letting me um, just say really hello, good evening to everyone for, or good morning to everyone for joining us. Um, these types of dialogues are so incredibly important. It, it's what makes uh, the School of Professional Studies so incredibly, I think, innovative, special, and unique in terms of the type of, of education that we deliver. And so thank you so much to Bryce, to Paul, um, Carol. It's, I really greatly look forward to hearing about your own impressive career, how you've really been able to blend um, business and innovation um, at these kind of top tier brands. And I, I think we're all in for a great treat. Um, this semester has been fantastic. And so thanks to all of our faculty and our students in the Go Local program um, and really just uh, looking forward to this conversation and um, really appreciate everyone taking time out of their very busy schedules to be part of our community and to share with us your experience and insights. So Michael, thank you for allowing me to say hello and really to all of our, um, our guests and faculty and students, thank you as well. And I look forward to this great evening. Well, fabulous, thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna let you uh, merge back into the uh, background if you want and, uh, and uh, to continue with your evening. Um, as well. So, uh, but thank you for joining us and please you get a chance to listen in. So without further ado, um, I, can I pass it back? We can pull this slide down. I'll pass it back to Bryce and Paul who uh, can introduce and kick off our evening. Thank you so much. All right, uh, let's get started here. Uh, uh, I'll just turn it over to Carol, uh, who uh, is, uh, you know, some, someone that we see often in Shanghai and uh, from time to time, uh, obviously a thought leader uh, in Shiseido. And I'll let her, uh, I know the first slide already, so I'll let her introduce herself. Take it away, Carol. Thank you, Bryce. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to be here. Um, you know, I think it's uh, when I was brainstorming with Bryce on what I want to talk about and what kind of topic would really be interesting. Um, we thought about, you know, how has beauty affected uh, China, the perception of beauty through the years? And you know, for me, especially since my 
almost my entire career has been in the industry. I thought I would be able to share with you some insights. And I, I want to make this session very interactive in terms of um, not so much data, because I, you know, although I work with data my entire career, I feel like it's very important to understand the insights behind um, why things are happening and the change in the, the trends. So I um, wanted to give you a, a more of a historical perspective of how has beauty evolved in China throughout the years and how has that impacted brands and um, how are consumers viewing their brands. So to start, um, I, I did a little presentation on, you know, just where I'm coming from so that you know a little bit of my background. So I'll just share my screen. Uh, let's see. So I grew up in, um, well, I was born in Guizhou. So Guizhou is in China, it's Southwest part of China. It's a, a province mostly known for the Maltai, uh, which you see in the picture there. It's uh, the most famous, I think, liquor, Baijiu in China. Um, so after I was born in Guizhou, I moved over to Wuhan um, for um, until the age of five. And then after two more years of school, um, I moved, the whole family moved to Philadelphia. So literally I grew up in Philly and uh, went to school at NYU. So I moved to New York and worked there for about 10 years. So my entire background has been, you know, shuffling between China and the US. So I kind of have a, a bigger kind of perspective of, you know, what's happening in both markets. And after um, my time at, um, uh, NYU. I studied marketing and international business. Um, I joined Unilever uh, working on Dove uh, and that was very privileged to start working for um, Dove at the time was extending into multiple categories and it was the first time they were trying to um, go into you know speaking to women in a different way. So we launched a Real Women campaign, which I think really defined the category at the time. Very lucky to work on that. Um, then I moved over to L'Oreal uh, in their professional uh, salon business and did a lot of product development, global, uh, global innovation, um, their so-called DMI department. Um, and after several years there, uh, I did, I moved away from the public sector and went over to private equity for two years and returned to uh, Amway and then worked on artistry and the skincare business there. Um, and, you know, throughout my, all these jobs, I've worked with China teams a lot and I really, you know, I'm being Chinese, I read Chinese and I could, you know, really speak the language. I felt that I would be much more, um, I would, you know, I want to be where the action was. I want to be in the market where the growth was. So I decided to move to Asia. And that's when I um, moved to Hong Kong and I joined Burberry. Uh, Burberry at the time has uh, taken back their beauty license. So I was in charge of um, looking after Burberry beauty um, for over 14 markets. And that is when, um, that's 2012, 2013 at the time. So, uh, you know, just at the start of the internet in China with, uh, you know, WeChat, um, Tencent, Ali, and we actually was the first uh, luxury brand to open up Tmall store. Um, so the first, you know, luxury brand to open up a Tmall store. So it was pretty, um, new and very uh, kind of pioneering at the time. <laughs> and uh, so after Burberry, I, I took a departure from beauty um, and fashion and I went over to Marriott International. So I did, uh, I worked on innovation around customer experience for the hotel, um, all of their luxury hotels. So um, I helped open W Shanghai. Uh, I looked after JW Marriott. So I got to really, you know, travel around the world, understanding consumers from a very different perspective. Um, because when I was working on beauty and fashion, I think, you know, you, the consumer has a product that they can take home, that they can use, right? So there was like a, a, my, a reminder of what that product were, um, uh, the product was. But when you're marketing an experience, which in the hotel, you can't take away the hotel room, right? You can't take away that memory. So I really, it was really interesting to understand 
the operational side of how do you promote and how do you bring the brand to life in a much more three-dimensional way um, versus just having a product. Um, and then in 2019, I moved to Shanghai and I joined uh, Shiseido where I'm at now. But my role is very different. Well, what I'm working on currently is um, I'm in charge of all of the new innovation for Shiseido Group um, based in China because we really believe that China is gonna be, well, it is our largest foreign markets outside of Japan and also the most important market for us because there's so much innovation here and we wanna be close to the consumer and be in this really unique ecosystem where there's so many new brands coming up and especially in the area of beauty, how do we interact with them and create new uh, synergies with the group? So part of my job is incubate our own brands. Uh, so starting from scratch, new brands, new business, new domains. At the same time, um, I, I'm look of, um, I look after investments. So we have a new Shiseido fund that will, will invest in new upcoming startups. So very interesting what I'm doing now. <laughs> so um, if you have any questions around, you know, just career, um, we can answer that later. So uh, just very briefly, I want to kind of capture, you know, the Chinese beauty market. It's actually number two after the U.S., but by year 2023, it will overtake U.S. to be the number one beauty market. And for me, there's three distinctive characteristics right now that kind of defines the category. Uh, number one is skincare is king. So in China, uh, in terms of beauty, unlike the U.S., skincare is the primary driver in a growth market. And everyone in China really, number one is you have to take care of your skin. So the skincare um, category is uh, way bigger than beauty, uh, cosmetics, color cosmetics market. Um, male segment is booming. So, you know, when you turn talks about like male beauty in Asia, especially in China, that's a huge category is growing at a tremendous rate. Um, you know, not just women, but men are using cosmetics um, way more. <laughs> and um, compared to the West, I think the skincare regimen of a typical Chinese, uh, let's say Gen Z male has at least five steps. Right, so it's uh, even more than some of the um, women, uh, I think, in the Western markets. And number three, we have a humongous uh, booming of domestic uh, local brands. That's driven by many factors, which I'll touch upon later. And when I talk about beauty in China, you know, I think beauty in China has profound social implications other than just beauty, what you see. Why? Because Beauty is number one, a symbol of success for most Chinese, right? So having a pretty face, this is from a consumer that we interview, it says having a pretty face is having a successful image. It means that I have a good job, a supportive family and a happy life. So it has the symbol that if I look good, I must be successful. Uh, and then number two, it's actually a tool for social advancement. Uh, so many, many women we talk to in all the interactions I've had is that they invest in the looks because they, it gives them benefits. So if they look good, they can get, go to the interview and they get a job that they want, right? If they look good, they get a lot of more benefits from the people around them. So they feel that it's a tool for social advancement. It gets them to uh, a place where they couldn't before. So it was a very important kind of stepping stone. And third, uh, in China, we call it face. It's kind of, um, you know, if you look good, it means that uh, you're giving face to your family. It shows that, you know, I take care of myself and um, people around us, my family feels that uh, I give them face. So these are, you know, there's a lot of social implication of what beauty means to a Chinese woman. Um, and then due to such early exposure to beauty concerns, uh, Chinese consumers have been increasingly sophisticated. So I'm going to go through a very short timeline on, you know, before 2010, I think it's very early for most of you, <laughs> the, the Chinese market, as well as the consumer, we call them the really beauty newbies. These consumers, this is pre all the internet boom, right? There's no, there's not much knowledge of what beauty routine or brands or anything. So the, their routine is very basic. It composes cleansers, maybe, you know, some moisturizer, maybe sunscreen. It's nothing very complex. 
But then throughout 2010 to 2015, uh, many consumers, because of the internet, because of new uh, bigger brands, you know, brands like L'Oreal, Estee Lauder, the groups, let's just say so, um, are entering in the market. So a lot of the consumers are uh, really after bigger names. They feel that the difference between a bigger international brand is that they give them the higher quality, the higher technology, and it gives them much more higher benefit, right? But then as as you evolve, as starting from, I think, 2015 to now, more and more niche brands are entering. There is, uh, you know, consumers are traveling more. Chinese, Chinese consumers are the largest outbound travelers in the, in the world. They go everywhere now. So when they travel more, they are more knowledgeable of brands and they're really interested in not just the brand itself, but the ingredients inside. And it, there's a lot more sophisticated in understanding what kind of ingredients give them what kind of benefit. So we call them ingredient centric or uh, consumers now where, you know, they're much more uh, interested in ingredients and understand the functionality. And they're not just going to purchase a brand for uh, because it's a big name. They actually will purchase the brand because they understand the ingredients, understand the science, much more logical, I would say. So as a result, you know, we think, you know, I think beauty is this obsession with beauty that we find in China. Um, <clears throat> for me, because I, I go back to the States often, I'm oh, sorry, <clears throat> and then um, I have family, my friends are in the States, but I find the consumers in the States not as obsessed with beauty as I think in China. Um, and people, especially the consumers in China now, uh, I would say even starting from 25, they say, oh, you know, I am starting to age. Like at the age of 25 is when I'm starting to use early anti-aging. So in Chinese, it's chu kang lao, right? So it's early anti-aging, starting 25. And then starting at 30, they start using a lot more um, other than skincare. So there is this boom of medical aesthetics market. So it's medical beauty where you go to a, a clinic or a hospital and they will give you uh, more, uh, you know, anything ranges from Botox injections to a uh, thermos uh, kind of machine laser. So there's a lot more younger consumers starting to uh, take on these anti-aging effects because they believe that they wanna stop aging before they start. So in the US, uh, when I was working, you know, at all the other companies there, people talk about anti-aging as we're reversing age. So it's like, you know, when I get to, let's say 35, I want to erase some of the fine lines I have, you know, some of the pigments. But in China, it's, I don't even want to, I don't want to see age. I want to freeze my age at this certain number. <laughs> like after 25, I want to be, you know, never age again. So that's the, that's the slight difference I see. And it has a profound effect. For example, you know, 49% of post 90s are using anti-aging products in China. And almost all of them are, <clears throat> are talking about how to you know, maintain their looks at the current age. So <clears throat> for me, I think um, for you to understand a little bit of why that is or how does the beauty evolved in China, I um, want to take you through the historical impact. Just I think sometimes it's better to understand um, a country through the history, history of it, and that kind of gives you insights of how consumers are, right? So in terms of the Cultural Revolution that happened in the 60s and to the 70s, so about 10 years, women in China um, were um, viewed as, you know, very equal to men. So uh, Chairman Mao, which was the first uh, Chinese president, all right, he, he really championed that women held half, up, half the sky. So women are not to even look feminine. So a lot of the pictures that you see in propaganda are women you know, dressed like men, they're carrying heavy equipment, they're doing everything that men does and they're not supposed to have long hair. All the women cut their hair really short. Um, nobody wore makeup. Everything was very plain, like you need to look like a man. <laughs> so beauty in that time was very, very much, I, I just need to look like a guy and no makeup, nothing. So that was kind of the historical context. But after the 80s and 90s, when China opened up, 
to, to the world, there was a huge influence uh, from Taiwan and Hong Kong. So a lot of the Hong Kong Taiwanese actresses that's outside of China um, through entertainment, through the media, um, people were, you know, like they understood what beauty was. So the perception of beauty in China at the time was very much from influenced by Taiwan and Hong Kong. And there's a lot of more local brands that started up like in the eighties, we have Dabao and some other brands, right? And then, but in the 80s and 90s, also international brands start entering. So including PNG, including Shiseido in 1981, um, as well as other brands that, you know, kind of the initial global brands entering China. So you, the consumers are exposed to these imageries of like Western women. So they actually was like, wow, I wanna have, you know, big set eyes, I wanna have high nose, I wanna have more three-dimensional facial structure. So Chinese women look toward the West for beauty, um, beauty ideals. And then in the uh, 2000s, a lot more local brands from China had started to um, emerge, including, uh, you know, all these brands that has TMC, traditional Chinese medicine component. And then in the early 2000s, uh, it's where L'Oreal Group, Esloda Group, the more premium uh, groups came into the market. And then you see a lot of the national brands in China, um, especially Shanghai Jiahua, Proya, and all of these brands are uh, right now more international, uh, more local domestic uh, listed groups in China, and they are starting to grow and um, expand as well. And then in the early 2000s, um, there's a huge influence by Korean drama and Korean pop, uh, which is the Korean, uh, the whole Korean movement <laughs> entering, uh, taking over in China through the media, through their uh, kind of music industry. So that has a big effect on the Chinese perception of what beauty was. So with skincare, really, really into the Korean look, right? Very, uh, you know, dewy skin, minimal makeup, looking very natural. Uh, makeup and hairstyle, very Korean, you know, have a lot of perms, but natural perms, uh, makeup very similar, and fashion as well. So everyone was copying and mimicking the Korean movie stars as well as pop stars. And they're using, especially a lot of the movies and entertainment dramas that they're watching, um, the beauty products that certain stars are using, then it was quickly, um, you know, out of stock. For example, YSL. YSL, um, because of a certain color of the lipstick in this drama, um, that was Lai Zi Xin Xin De Ni. It's a, one of a really popular drama back in 2013, I believe. And because of that, YSL, the whole brand became super popular in China. And that was the movement of starting to, everyone looks the same. So everyone's like, oh, you know, we want the Korean look. So all of the Chinese uh, consumers are mimicking the looks. And this is actually a picture of uh, one of the Miss Korea uh, competition. And uh, it was hotly debated because everyone pretty much looks the same with the same similar uh, makeup. So that was kind of the beauty ideal at the time. It's very, very Korean. And then moving on to a few years later, um, the picture shown here is Fan Bingbing. She was one of the very famous movie stars in China. Um, everyone wants to look like her. She was kind of the beauty ideal at the time in China. Um, and because of her, she has a very unique look. Her face is very small, very triangle, big eyes, really pale. All of this, we would say the, the, the girls want to look like her. So they will go and get plastic surgery or they'll do all the makeup um, that, that mimics the look of her. So back in uh, maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago, it was all about similar look that wants to look like her. So that was the beauty ideal at the time. Um, and also in 2015, starting then, is where all of the internet, um, the boom started with Taobao, with, um, with Jingdong, with all of these new platforms in China that has propelled um, all of the growth of 
the brands. So consumers can literally use their mobile and purchase a brand and uh, it will get to their house within a few hours. And this is the only place in the world where you have access to so many things on a very, very easily accessed um, uh, ecosystem. And through that, there uh, recently, especially the past two years due to COVID, there was um, a lot of new channels to reach consumers, such as live streaming, short video content. So a lot of the brands that's uh, entering China now, as well as local um, brands that are stemming, are really using these platforms to reach consumers in a much more effective way. And that really generated um, you know, growth in the sector. Uh, Okay, I'm going to skip over to some of the more. Um, uh, so just this double 11, double 11, uh, for most of you who don't know, is uh, like, it's like Big Friday, a Black Friday in China. It's um, the biggest selling holiday. And this one that just passed, November 11th, we had the two uh, top KOLs or the influencers in China selling, um, you know, unprecedented uh, record. So Austin Lee is the, the guy uh, on the left. He broke 10 billion in the first day in his sales. And Weiya, which is the girl on the right, she broke over 8 billion. So just these two people <laughs> had, um, we, we say that they sold more products than most companies can do in, in the whole year or even a few years. So that's really amazing. Uh, that happens only in China. And because of all of these local um, startups uh, over the past years, they really start to grow, especially the really emerging brands. So we have uh, Perfect Diary as well as Florist. These are the color cosmetics, two brands that has been number one and number two for the past, I would say four years in China. And you have really local skincare brands that are focused on skin sensitivity. They grew, uh, they grew up with the doctor networks in the hospitals. So they include uh, Wei Nuona and Dr. Yu. So these are the local um, brands that are currently very, very much a part of um, what's happening in China. The, the younger consumers, especially Gen Z um, consumers, really embrace these brands because they, they grew up in an era where China is uh, basically, you know, China has become more like of uh, an international country where they, they see um, everywhere they go, the Chinese consumers are purchasing all the luxury goods. Um, all of the brands are talking to consumers. So they really feel that China has been, become like the center of the world. So when they look at these local products and local brands, they feel affinity to them and they really want to support them as well. So with this movement, um, as we see them moving forward, uh, the these local startups will become bigger and bigger. And I would say will start taking shares away from the international brands as well. So we see a lot of competition um, between them. And this is just an interesting chart I found that, you know, what has the new Chinese startups, um, how, how, how big are they growing? Um, really like they have grown so much tremendously in a very short amount of time. So for example, if you look at, um, let's look at Home Facial Pro, which started in 2016, is um, one of the ingredient-centric local brands. And they've grown to 300 million in you know, less than, I would say, five years. And sometimes that would you know, be unheard of anywhere else, right? So you know, they're able to achieve to a size that most brands can't achieve in 10, 20, or even 50 years. So you see these new startups in China boom um, there's a lot of potential for them moving forward because of the ecosystem, because of the consumer, and because of the growth. And as we enter 2022, um, I see even more brands enter in China because the government has eased off on animal testing. So before, a lot of brands cannot enter China because they have to go through animal testing, and that's against their kind of a mission or brand value. But now the animal testing has been eliminated. There's a lot more niche brands that are able to enter China, and you see a lot more competition. So you see a lot of interesting international players competing with uh, large local players, as well as niche local players, as well as brands like ours, which is international multi-category, um, multi, -category, multi 
portfolio players. So the market has become so fragmented um, and so competitive. But you know, I always say China is, um, even though China is a huge market and it has so many different consumers, there is something for everyone. So in the future, um, I do see the market getting even more fragmented. But as long as you, you find your consumer, you target them well, um, you will find that category and that niche for, for your brand. So it's very important to really identify what that is. And you know, also moving forward, it's a, really about diversified beauty. There is not really one type of beauty or deals anymore. Although I think in China, you still see being pale, having like you know, an oval face still being very uh, uh, desirable. There's much more movement towards a diversified look, right? Like people are no longer going to the plastic surgeon and saying, oh, I wanna look like her, but more like, okay, I want to look like myself, but making my own features more distinctive. So you see this movement towards more diversified beauty. People want to maintain who they are and keeping their unique features um, and just you know, really embracing their own true beauty. So because of that, with the fragmentation of the market, I do see that in the future in China, the growth of the beauty market is only gonna be even more intense and it will be uh, a very interesting market um, in the next three to five years with all of the uh, new players entering as well as very interesting um, consumers trying to, you know, and uh, using consumer data to give them a more personalized approach. Um, uh, I see a lot more uh, uh, brands entering with science background, um, more centered around, you know, data, how to make your, how to make your look much more um, you, truly you. So it's really about, understanding the consumer, really targeting your brand in a really well way. And uh, it's gonna be a very interesting market. So I think that's kind of <laughs> overall what I wanted to talk about today. I think I'm, hopefully I'm within my time limit. <laughs> Open for any questions. <laughs> Carol, that was great. Um, fantastic overview. And it's always good to sort of see the, the role how beauty has evolved, right? And the definition of beauty here in China. I really like that slide that you put together and I'm a big fun, uh, fun being being fan myself. So um, just one question. We, we just came out of double 11. All right. And, and you showed the slide around Li Jiaqi, which I watched, you know, religiously for the last two days leading up to double 11 via. Um, and then you had the, the element around startups and how they're growing so quickly. And a lot of that you said was based on the ecosystem and the infrastructure. Mm -hmm here um here in this market which is really you know digital and 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 the foundation around e-commerce can you just talk a little bit about how shiseido has tackled e-commerce um mm -hmm. in 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 terms of how you've you know either you know setting up your own sort of platform working with distributors or other uh partners in that space um just sort of shed some insight on the e-commerce element from an organizational mm -hmm. standpoint from from your end yeah Sure. I mean, right now uh, we have about in our prestige, uh, our premium business, we're about 40% e-commerce, uh, the rest offline, but our target is to make it 50-50. I think that's kind of a, uh, we believe is a good balance for, for our brand. Um, and for the, a lot of the local startups, because of, you know, internet is the must, I think a few years ago, the internet was the, the least expensive route to get to your consumer in the most effective way, right? So a lot of these new newcomers are um, really, they don't have any offline stores. They, they enter through direct to consumer, which is on e-commerce. And they're able to you know, really target these consumers in the right moment and um, capture them. But as more and more these local startups started, as well as everyone entering e-commerce, it's getting much more expensive on these e-commerce uh, e platforms. Forms. So now you see a movement actually towards going back to brick and mortar because it's actually cheaper <laughs> to, uh, to attract consumers in a brick and mortar than to pay for the traffic on e-commerce. So um, I personally believe that, you know, as, as, as a brand, like a true, I think, you know, beauty, fashion, whatever brand you're in, you have to give consumers a holistic experience. So that's 
e-commerce as well as brick and mortar, you give them a complete experience. So I don't think one can exist without the other. E-commerce is for the convenience, it's for kind of maintaining your kind of, um, you know, your messaging, capturing the data, but then offline, you know, to brick and mortar is where you actually get to touch and feel, you know, in beauty, you know, in my, in my category, beauty is something that you have to experience. You, you want to talk to someone who can say, oh, you know, what was your skin type or what color Color works for you. So it's much more, um, I think for me, it's an offline experience to discover brands. So these two actually really needs to integrate and work together. Um, so you, you know, so I don't know if that answers the question, but we, we, we want to achieve where it's like 50-50, but depending on the brand and what their uh, value proposition is, we want to have much more offline um, experiential um, touch points. And then online is, uh, you know, we can give them much easily accessible, maybe um, convenience factor and keeping in touch with them, uh, you know, through the beauty advisors, both all offline and online. Great. Bryce. Hey, Carol, uh, I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that there are just so many local players. There's so many global players involved. And just being here, I've noticed that the product life cycles are incredibly short now. I mean, when, you know, 10 years ago, we always talked about the 10 month product life cycle. I think it's probably half of that now, uh, especially, in, especially in beauty and cosmetics where, where everyone's competing in the same space. And you also mentioned you know, the local startups as well coming up. Uh, I know for a fact that Shiseido just launched, you launched, your team launched a new uh, INRU. I have, am I pronouncing that correctly? Okay, I get the Chinese right, not the English. The <laughs> uh, so what do you think, how can, how can the global brand stay competitive in, in a market where there's so much competition? Yeah, I, I often get asked that because, um, you know, in the past couple of years with these local startups um, and how they have, you know, really, I, I wouldn't say threatened, but a lot of people ask me, you know, are, are, are you guys threatened by these local players? I, I, I have a, you know, I have a very, my opinion is I think the pie is getting bigger because China is such a big market. You know, consumers are learning about brands. Um, the opening up of China only started 40 years ago. So it's, it's a young market, right? People are always hungry to get to know more brands. So I don't think it's, I think the pie is getting bigger. It's actually better for the consumer, but they have more option. Um, what we're good at, like the international players are, you know, we have a really strong R&D and we actually have, you know, Shiseido's been around for over uh, almost 150 years, right? So we have all of these technology and skincare data from all the way back and we're able to really invest in the, the formulation of products and really give consumers, um, you know, tested well formulas. We may not be the best at, oh my God, adapting like the latest consumer trends, which we're trying to improve, you know, but with any big company, international player, we're not as fast as the local players. I mean, that's a fact because local players, they're small startups, you know, they don't, they might not need so many steps or testing to get a formula up, right? They might not need to do, go through a lot of processes, decision-making um, that a big company does. But what they're really good at is they're really good at consumer insight. They know exactly how the market is turning and they wanna capture consumers at a very certain point. And you see the startups are very niche. Sometimes they're only doing, they're very focused on one aspect. So this, this one brand is only, you know, they're only gonna focus on, let's say, a sensitive skin. Right. They don't care about anything else, just one sense of the skin. They want to they want to really tackle that and then really be really good at that. Um, and they're able to adapt very easily. So, you know, there is a we, we serve different roles, um, but I do see that as these local players in China evolve, they have to go back to the foundation of the product itself. What I see is a lot of these local startups are not really, they don't really invest in R&D. Most of them don't have an R&D, right? They just go to an OEM or a factory that can create formulas for them. They put a new label on it. And most of their um, story is really about marketing and really, you know, 
making this product very, it looks nice, it captures consumers at the right moment, but the product itself, they haven't really invested. So, so that's why there's a lot of brands that are dying because they, they, they enter the market, consumers are interested, they try it. And they're like, okay, I tried it. It's not very good. I'm going to go back to the brand that I really like. So, you know, so therefore a brand can be very successful, successful, right? For maybe a few months or even up to a few years. And then they die off once they stop promoting it because they don't have a core value proposition. So in the next couple of months, I will say that a many, many new brands that the local brands that have started up may, may, may go away. And what will remain are the brands or the companies that actually care really about the formulas and the product itself and invest in R&D and sustainable growth. Um, and that's what I think the large players has advantage of over, over the local players. Mm. That's really interesting. Uh, thanks, Carol. Uh, Michael, you have a question? Yeah, Carol, there was um, some interest in the Q&A from students about the, the, I think, the clean beauty market and, and how that's uh, established. And obviously, you've spoken a bit to some of those forces. But in the US, we know, and clearly you worked on Dove, so you know even better than us, that this whole question about body image and, um, you know, and, and, and how the role beauty and fashion play, uh, you know, either positive or negative in that. Or, or questions perhaps around sustainability and the environment and you know what's happening uh, with waste and packaging H how would you characterize you know the role of that movement uh, clean beauty or you know body image or in, in China in driving consumers and, and their choices um, I think in terms of body image that is definitely changing um, even you know, ten years ago when I used to come to China for for I just came to China, there isn't much diversity or in terms of what the ideal figure should look like. <laughs> you know, it's very it's always like very skinny, very tall, right? But I think now um, through just different media and women becoming much more confident in themselves, you see a lot more um, diversity in terms of what they want to look like. So, you know, they want curvier bodies and they want to embrace themselves. So, and then there's new brands. Um, there's many new brands right now with the proposition of, you know, embracing your own body image, right? Like there's a brand called Nay Wai, which um, it's, very similar to Dove, actually. <laughs> it's really about embracing your true self. Um, and so on the areas of body image, I think as Chinese women become much more confident in their own kind of beauty, uh, that would, I would say, follow um, the steps of the US. I mean, although not as diverse, right? There's still, there's still this, you know, there's wider definition of beauty, but it's still very, is much more narrow than the US. Um, but in terms of clean beauty, um, the movement hasn't really uh, come to China, although people know about it, right? People, people perception of clean is, you know, there is a lot of uh, women, especially in certain key period of their life. So, you know, doing pregnancy or a certain area, they understand that what you put on your body or inside your body, um, has some harmful effects. So there's there's many um, there's more there's a lot of consumers that are starting to ask questions and care about what goes into these formulations. However, Chinese consumers in general still view efficacy over what is harmful. <laughs> so, for example, they need you know if the formula is clean it's great, right? But it still has to work. They, if you do you have two formula, both, uh, you know, both are similar, right? In terms of, um, I guess, clean, but one maybe works much better and it's not as clean that the other, they will still pick the one that is, you know, less clean, but more effective. So the, you know, the, the, the value they, they put on this clean is not as strong yet. But I think, you know, because everything happens so fast in China, um, you never know, maybe in the next, I don't know, year, it could be a huge thing where people are much more concerned um, about what goes into their body, right? But overall, the clean movement hasn't been as, you know, it's not as prevalent as in the US.
Yeah, I want I want to I want to follow up if you don't mind, Bryce and Paul, because I was part of a discussion earlier in the week with uh, J Jim Stengel, you know, who's the former CMO of um, of PNG and Marsha Cook, who who's a senior person at Vice Media, all about purpose and brands. And one of the questions that was asked of them and that was asked of the panel was about, you know, is this attitude towards purpose uh, different in China? And, you know, I shared with them because others have shared with us on these, this series of calls that, you know, there was a feeling that the product functionality perhaps was a little bit more important in the Chinese, among Chinese consumers. Um, and you, and you're, you, I think you're calling it a, a efficacy here, you know, or, uh, and so I wondered, you know, whether you would share some thoughts at all about that, you know, this, this whole purpose-driven marketing has become so central to a lot of way, the way brands think in the mm. U.S., um, you know, how is that impacting your industry? Do you see that in China? What, what, what's going on? Yeah. Um, again, I, 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 I always um, remind everyone that China is, it's like a baby market <laughs> compared to even the U.S., right? You know, 1980 is probably the year that we opened to, to everything. So it's only been 40 years. So the idea of brands in general is very new. Um, and people in general who understand brand probably happened in the last 10 years, right? Understanding what brand stands for, what is a brand value proposition. So much of their knowledge about brands are actually product. You know, when people say, oh, this is a great brand, they actually mean this is a good product because they're much more, um, uh, I guess they value the efficacy or the functionality of the product versus understanding what does this brand means. So, so with that in mind, I think it takes time for the market or actually the consumers here to develop that high idea of purpose. But you see that with like the young generation, right? Like the Gen Z post 95, they understand what a brand is and they, they, they aspire, they relate to brands that speak to their language. So as we move forward, I think that is going to be even more and more important. Um, you know, consumers will go back to the brand that they can relate to and that speaks to their value system um, much more than just the functionality because end of the day, anyone can make something very similar, right? Anything can be copied in China, anything can, <laughs> you, you, you make something, next day someone can make the same exact thing. But what really makes you stand out is what are you offering the consumer on a much more higher level that they can relate to? So, you know, I think, I think we're evolving to that. Um, just give it, just give the market and the consumer some time. Mm. I love, I love that answer. Yeah, I really, I really, that's a very thoughtful answer. Paul, I'll, I'll send this back to you. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm just going to take one of the questions that's in the Q&A from John. And, you know, being a, being a strategist and a planner myself, there's this element around when you get into conversations with clients, a lot of times they go straight to tactics, right? So his element is all around influencers and KOLs. And I know that in China, there's, we always, you know, unfortunately, sometimes we start off with, you know, who's our KOL? Why don't we start there versus starting from the brand? Um, it's starting to happen also with live stream. Right. So can you just share a little bit of your perspective in terms of KOLs in this market in China um, and how, you know, Shiseido approaches it differently? This element around live stream, you know, some of the KOLs are really connected to live stream and, and they use that as their main delivery vehicle. Um, mm. what, what is sort of the, the Shiseido's policy on, on KOLs? How do you approach them? Um, mm -hmm. You know, just love to just understand that. Um, I, I guess I can't speak for Shiseido because each of our brands have their own KOL uh, or, you know, kind of the, their own approach to how they do it. But for me, I think, um, I think the KOLs in China is slightly different from the influencer in the U.S. Um, the, the influence in the U.S., I, you know, KOLs actually came from the, you know, influence in the U.S., right? The, the term actually is from the U.S., but the influence in the US, I feel, are much more, has much more of the individual personality as a start because, you know, they have, um, you know, starting with um, uh, Michelle Fan, who, who was like the first YouTube makeup, you know, influencer in the US, right? Back in the day, she had a very unique, like, 
her style and what she, her approach, her philosophy of how she wants to educate cons- uh, her her fans are right, and then everything stemmed from there. Whereas because KOLs in China developed in a very different way, that they're much more a channel that. You know, I am a channel for the consumer to buy a certain product, or I am a channel for the consumer to find out something else. They don't, as a start, they, maybe now there's a few KOLs that does, but you know, in general, they didn't start out as having their own personality or their own kind of, you know, her their own brand, for example. So they're a little bit weak in that. So therefore, when brands are choosing KOLs, they're looking at only like, oh, what's their what's the traffic? How many people can they bring to see my brand, or can they explain this way? So it's judged in a very different way. Um, but I do see that the KOLs in China are, you know, especially the younger ones, and as well as um, just as the mo- the market evolved and developed they become much more um, stronger in the way that their own, what do I stand for? And how do, what is my approach to explaining this concept and how do I educate my fans, you know? And so as they get stronger, I do see that there's more value in selecting the right KOL. Whereas before it's, you know, nobody, it's, it's almost like, if I want to launch something, I just want to give it to everybody, and there's no one to really pick from, and it's very hard to evaluate their 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 value. Um, and because of that, I think you know in the future the KOLs will be much more influential um, in the way that they are more than more so than now. Because right now, if you look at live streaming, it's basically just Austin and Weya. I mean, they're like the top two, and number two is like way down there, right? So there, is, there isn't a very good balance. So um, hopefully there's gonna be much more um, KOLs that has much more influence. And even with live streaming, I always say live streaming to me is like the home shopping network 2.0. <laughs> you know, it's like back in the day, instead of watching TV or you're watching your, your phone or your, your laptop or something or iPad. So live stream to me currently is super boring like i don't i i feel like it's not a brand building thing it's literally just a very tactical promotional vehicle that if you want to sell your product in a large amount of people yeah you can approach it but it needs to be done in conjunction of brand building tactics as well so um and in the future as we evolve towards live stream i don't know 2.0 3.0 right where you can actually talk about brand story, you can educate consumer, you make it more interesting in the live stream environment, then it's much more about building brands. Because currently all I see is just very promotional. Um, there's no brand, brand building tactics in live stream. Can I, can I ask, can I, I know Bryce has a sort of uh, finishing up question, but can I jump in with one of our, um, you know, one of our students had a good question, I think, about sort of local innovation, and then Bryce, we can finish with you. Um, you know, he was very interested in the work, I guess, you're doing of op- opening local labs, and, uh, you know, uh, at least he, he reported that um, the, uh, there was a local lab center in China, uh, mm. you know, set up for Chinese, I guess, uh, you know, scientists or what have you. Can you, could you talk a little bit more about this idea of local innovation and, and how that that investment is driving some of your work. Yeah, um, so you know, Shiseido, and like many multinational companies, our R and D center used to be in Japan, right? Everything was developed there. We are base, basic research is there. So what we do in terms of R and D in China is we, I mean, essentially we just adapt the formulas from the Japan and we kind of modify them. But what we realize is you know, we, the consumers here are very important and they have different needs than Japanese consumers. We need to actually start from here. So we, we want to, we want to have a team of people here that will be um, investing or um, discovering new technologies, new uh, ingredients that can cater to Chinese consumers. So that's, that's kind of the opening of our new, um, uh, R&D lab in Shanghai, where we're going to be focused on, you know, basic research in China, working in collaboration with the Japanese lab 
that way we feel we can actually develop something that's truly localized uh, versus you know local adaptation mm. hey carol so uh we have a lot of students on on in joining our webinar today and we always ask our speakers to talk about some career advice um, mm -hmm. as as an american uh as a unique american uh sitting you know between uh between between philly and guizhou maotai uh <laughs> <laughs> um, hopefully those won't don't combine those together that could be a lethal combination i think um what kind of career advice do you give the students uh who are who are looking to you know come and work in china or uh with you know in the beauty business should should they spend some time should they should they graduate come straight out to china try to find work at a, at a large company uh, should they work uh, in other big companies in, in America for a while? What do you think? What's what's the best plan for? Hmm. That's a tough question because I I feel like there's not like a right path because you know some people might think if I graduate I should go to a big company you know like like, like a Unilever, PNG, L'Oreal where you you get to learn the foundation right you kind of understand what is the product development process you understand marketing from a very like a um, traditional kind of way, right? And then there's people who think, oh, um, you should go work for a startup and you learn really from the ground up what actually happens. And, you know, you can make decision in a single day and see results the next day. Like that's how fast it is, right? There's, I don't think there's a right or wrong way. I think find what fits with your personality because I don't think everyone is right to work in a startup because you really need to, work very hard, you put in a lot of time and in 99% of the time you will fail. Like it's not a very, um, it's not a stable thing, right? So if you're the type of person who don't like surprises and like cannot work in ambiguous environments, don't go work in a startup, like start with a big company and learn the foundation and go from there. Maybe in the future you can go, you know, but just, but if you're the per kind of person who's like, I, I have no patience for process. Um, I don't really care for the so-called ways of working, but I want to discover my new own way. And I'm really into trying different things and taking risks. Then a startup will be really suitable. Um, in China, in this market, you can do anything. Um, you know, you just need to go and try. And if you're not afraid of failure and trying different things, then I, I see it as only growth and learn, you know, learn as you go kind of way. So there isn't really a right path. I think it's just find what suits your personality. Oh. I think that's an amazing note to end on, Carol, and, and very good, wise, sane and human advice. So we, we, uh, we appreciate that. I think that uh, we often tell students, you know, they, they, they want to think there's a, you know, five year, 10 year, 20 year plan or something, and, and they can plot it all out. But uh, uh, it's a lot probably more, um, you know, sort of sensing and experiencing and, and, you know, as you said, finding what fits uh, at the time in the situation. So, so, uh, you know, immensely uh, wonderful uh, conversation at all sorts of different levels, Carol, I think we're going to bottle some of this and distribute it out to classrooms and, you know, have, have folks um, listen in again about what you had to say. I particularly enjoyed uh, the way you presented some of these really foundational insights at the beginning. So thank you so, so much for that. Um, and thank you to Bryce and Paul, uh, who always uh, bring wonderful guests into our community. And I want to thank you uh, both to and um, to our colleagues, uh, Robin and, uh, and, and Pat Trick, who have helped make the evening possible. So uh, for those who ask questions that we didn't get to, what I'm going to attempt to do is I'll get some questions over to, um, uh, to Carol and see if, if she has a chance maybe to answer them offline. And when we send out the video, et cetera, we'll send out some additional notes. Um, and uh, if, if Carol, you're comfortable sharing the presentation, we, we can do that as well. So anyway, but many, many thanks from all of us at uh, the School of Professional Studies um, and uh, to our colleagues in Shanghai, particularly, we hope you have a good day as we all slump off to bed. You, you guys are starting your day. So uh, we hope you have a wonderful day and uh, thank you very, very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.